Some of the disciplines that we've studied were on this series, if you didn't know it, uh, called Under the Hood. And really, it's just as Christians, there are things that, you know, like under your hood of your car, there are things that you, you pay a lot of attention to, or as your car, you pay a lot of attention to. Uh, not under your hood, but a part of your car. You pay a lot of attention to your gas. Mo most of you probably fill up often. Uh, the oil change, not quite as often as gas is put in, but you need to change your oil. Your car tires need to be changed. And some of these disciplines are stuff that you're going to do almost every day. Hopefully you pray every day. Hopefully you're finding time and ways to meditate and be silent before the Lord every day in a busy world. I think that's, that's important. Some of the things you're going to do less often, fasting. Hopefully you don't fast every day. That would not probably be healthy for you. But that you set aside time. Sometimes maybe you fast a lot, you know, every other day or once a week or once a month. And maybe sometimes you set aside big chunks of time to fast. Today, and, 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 well, some of these disciplines too are, are very much individual ones. You know, when I think of prayer, I, I think that goes both ways. I mean, you, we should be praying in our closet, but we should also be praying together corporately. Fasting, I think most of the time we fast, we probably fast on our own. But you read scriptures, and there were times that corporate fasts were called for. The whole community got together and would fast for a certain purpose or a certain reason. Solitude, I don't know about you, but it seems like a lonely thing. It seems like something you probably do on your own. Although, a couple Thursdays ago, we had a corporate time of solitude. Last week, we did a few minutes of solitude. We did that together. And it's good to do those things together. This one that I'm going to talk about today, most of the time when we talk about being guided by the Holy Spirit, being guided by God, it's, we talk about individually. You hear God's voice. You, as you read, God is going to speak to you. And I think in our culture, this western United States where we live, I is a big word. I can do that. I can hear from God. God speaks to me. And don't get me wrong. I want you to be people who set aside time and you hear from God. You hear from God about what's going on in your family, in your life, at your workplace. But I also think there's something, and this is what we're going to do. We're not going to get whole, we're not going to be able to get very deep like all of these. We're just kind of skimming the surface, kind of dropping them in your heart and in your mind, and then God's going to grow them in us. But I want us to talk about hearing God's voice corporately as a group of people. Now, we all know Jesus went away 40 days and fasted. He was alone to hear from God, to be connected with God. We know that Jesus often late in the day or early in the morning would go away to be with his father to hear his voice. We know that. Moses went on the mountaintop by himself. But there are also pictures in the Bible of corporate guiding, leading by the Holy Spirit, by God. The children of Israel, God didn't lead them out of Egypt one at a time. He led them out as a people, a whole group. <clears throat> they, had, they were guided by the Holy Spirit, by God, as a corporate group. They all walked out. <clears throat> they all saw the pillar. They all saw the cloud. It wasn't just Moses going, I see the cloud, it's this way. They were all able to see, and they were going the same direction because God was leading not just Moses, but all of them. And so that's just really important to realize. Today, you know, I want to look at some scriptures. If you'll turn with Matthew 18, verse 20. And this is just one of those very, you, you probably already know this, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in their midst. Now that doesn't mean that when you're in your closet praying, if you're alone, that God's going like, you're wasting your time. Because didn't you read that scripture in Matthew? It takes two or three of you for me to be in your midst. No, he's still there. But I think there's something powerful this scripture is saying. There's something even more that happens when two and three of you get together. I love God's math. It's not common core math. It's real math. 
It's God-inspired math. One will put how many to flight? A thousand. Two will put 10,000. Isn't that great math? 1,000 plus 1,000 in my math is 2,000. One person, 1,000. Second person, 2,000. Put them together, you get 2,000. God says no. One can put 1,000. Two can put 10,000. What can 60 do? I should have asked Larry because I don't know what the component of that would have been to say if, okay, if one does 10 and I mean, and two, if one does 1,000 and two does 10, what does 60 do? It's a whole bunch. With that kind of math, just imagine if 60 people corporately hear God's voice and we all start going the same direction, if one of you can put 1,000, two of us can put 10,000, 60 of us can rock Rapid City. 60 of us can not only rock Rapid City, but we'll penetrate Pennington County. We'll impact South Dakota. I have a feeling with the size of South Dakota, we'll even go a little bit further than that. If 60 people, mathematically, God's math comes together and we do that. Ecclesiastics says that two is better than one. Corporately, we're stronger than if we're on our own. If I fall down and I'm by myself, I'm out of luck, quite possibly. I'm embarrassed to admit this, but it's a great illustration. Marcus and I took a motorcycle ride a few weeks ago. Not the smartest thing we probably ever did. It was just snowed. We took um, Bannocker, which goes from uh, Nemo to Sturgis. We hit some slush. We hit some snow. I hit the ground. We were going very slow because it was icy, but I hit one of those. I was leading, so I couldn't make it to the rut that the pickup or the car had just done. So I go over the little bit of rut. I'm going about 15 at that time, I really think. And it just, I, it just the whole bike went. And I'm alongside of it, sliding along, you know, going down the road and thinking, oh, no, Marcus is right behind me. This could be really bad, not only for him, but for me. But the whole point of this is not that I fell, it's that this new bike that I have, I couldn't have got it up if I was by myself. I needed to have a Marcus with me. I would have been flagging down somebody to help me. Good news is it didn't hurt my bike. I got up and we made it home. I was soaking wet and a little chilly and a little embarrassed. But if I'd have been alone, I'd have been stranded there. Two is better than one. Ecclesiastic makes that very clear. Again, when Jesus took his people out of Israel, they all saw the pillar. They all saw the cloud. What would happen if we all prayed together? Not just in the same room, but about the same thing. With intensity, with purpose, with a goal, with a passion. Vern, you asked this on, on, on Thursday, not even knowing where we're going. You're going like, what would happen if we all would just go, you know what, we're going to look at our body. We're going to start right here and go, are there, are there any sick among us? We're going to spend a week, all of us, just going, God, we want to see healing power come through this body. Not just one, not just two, not just three people praying. But what if we all purposely did that? What if we fasted together for something along those lines? For vertebrae to become back in line. For MS to be gone, for vertigo to be gone, for diabetes to not be a part of our culture. What would happen? One, a thousand, two, ten thousand, sixty. Could we change our Now, not to say that we do this and we go like, well, you said this, this, so we're going to hold you hostage, God, because we think we're hearing your voice and you want to do healing. I think God wants to do healing, but I think healing goes way beyond pancreas being repaired. I think it goes to the heart of the matter. I know my tailor is diabetic, and, and she gets really bummed about it sometimes because she knows God heals. She knows God is the God that does that. But she also knows that every year she runs into a little girl and a mom that's freaked out by diabetes. She gets to sit down with them and say, you know what, there's life even when you do have diabetes. God heals, but it's not the end of the world. You can get... So anyways, God is using her we read in the spirit in, in the spirit we read in the bible you know where the apostles you know i have a thorn 
in my flesh, and God chooses not to heal it. And, and they were okay with that. But, P.S., I think we're not even scratching the surface of what God wants 50, 60 of us to be living in. You know, we can go like, oh, God heals some people. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not discrediting this at all. We're all going to be healed. When we go into heaven, we're not going to take any of our baggage with us. But you know what? That is true. But it is also true that the God that heals is available today. Okay? That's just, healing is just one part of it. But what would happen if we all fasted like they did in Esther? What would, we, what would happen if we all got a hold of something and did that? What if we became like, not the man from Issachar, but from like the men, and that's the men and women in this culture of Issachar. They were David's mighty men. I, this is my favorite. They weren't good with a sword. They weren't good with a javelin. They weren't good with a shield. They didn't have anything. You know what they had? This is my favorite mighty men. They discerned the time in which they lived and they knew what to do. What if we were a group of people who all of a sudden corporately got an insight into what God's plan for Rapid City was and we said we're all going to do that together. We're going to go that way. I got a hint for you. A little bit of a God's plan for this church and what he'd like to see. God's will is that none should perish, but that all would come to know him. So I think if we were a group of people who said we want to see Rapid City get saved, we would be in line with God's will. We want to see people that are far from him get close to him, and if we as a group of people took that on as a corporate calling from God, we'd be right in line with God's word. And it says, ask anything in my name, and it'll be done. You don't get it because you ask wrong. You ask for, with wrong motives. You ask for your own gain. I'm not asking so our church will explode. I'm asking because I want to see, and my heart, I want my heart to be more broken when I look out into the lost and I see people lost. I want my heart to just go, oh, God, what can we do? Maybe center shot is a piece of that puzzle. I, 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 was, I told Lori, I said, I think I need to take a tub this church, I, I'll, I won't do this, you don't need to get freaked out or anything, but, because I said, man, I, I preached this message last night as I was soaking, and it was good, and if I could preach it half as good as it was in the tub, it would be kicking, so next week, if there's a tub up here, get nervous, because I'm going to be soaking, in, no, I won't do that, but I, I, I was thinking, I, I thought, you know, we have this, this establishment in town called uh, Shotgun Willies, and you know what, a good prayer is saying, God, there are, there are, it, it's, a, it's a dance club and, and, and there are people that go and, and watch and participate it, it, it's, it's probably not the greatest job and you know what a good prayer would say God just close down that place I thought you know what God that is a good prayer but you know what shut that place down and the heart of that owner and the heart of those dancers and the heart of the people who sit and watch them haven't changed a bit what if our prayer was God I just pray that everybody that goes to work at Shotgun Willies would get saved. Wouldn't that be cool if Shotgun Willies shut down because they're going like, everybody's getting saved that's working. We can't, we have no employees. Well, in fact, we don't even have an owner because he got saved. We did a thing in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Dave Argue was just great to us when we were there. And God gave me a vision to go into the sleaziest nightclub in Lincoln. It was called Temptations, just to give you a clue. And that's all this place was about. Lead me not into something, lead me into temptation. It was the whole thing. He took a scripture verse and twisted it. Rusty, he was a great guy, but he, he, was, he was banking off of this. And, and we went in there, and I told Rusty one day, we, were, we turned out to be good friends. He ended up coming to the youth group. He ended up getting saved. I said, Rusty, I'm praying that you'll go out of business. I, I thank you for letting me use you, but I pray that this isn't going to go on very long because you're going you're to know that this isn't what you're supposed to be doing and you're going to sell it. It's going to close. You're going to get out of here. I said, I just want to let you know how I'm praying. If you, if you want to end our relationship, I get it. And he said, no, that's cool. I kind of want it to end too. But wouldn't that be great if something like that, because we can change the outside of men, but if we don't change the heart, we've done nothing. We just redressed the harlot. We've just re redressed the, hate, the hater, the liar, the stealer. 
a little bit of a side note. What would happen if we all got involved? I, you've heard this before, but it's my favorite illustration about this. When we were in Watertown, we had a guy named Grandpa, my mind just went blank, Fran and Ray. Ray had two Belgian horses, and he did horse pulls with them, Amos and Andy. Amos could pull 700 pounds by himself. Andy could pull 650. 1350, right? Together, they pulled 2,700 pounds. And I said, well, what's going on? He goes, it's, it's, it, 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 here's the deal. That if Amos or Andy, when they're pulling, if one of them pulls a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, in fact, some days they can't even pull what one of them can pull together because they're not working together. If they don't work together, if they don't pull together, they'll actually pull less than one of them could. But when they're, Joel, when they're in gear and I get them going at the right time and as everything's going, it's 27. I think he's even done 3,000. And he goes, it's synergy. It's that one can do this, but two can do even more. That's the math that works here. What would happen? What would happen if we would get a hold of this? What would happen if we would be like that 120 in the upper room? Jesus said, go and wait. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. They were there in one place, in one mind, in one accord. They just weren't in one place. We're in one place, but we can think a whole bunch of different things need to happen. What if we got this corporate call from God and we bought into it? What would happen corporately if we did that? What happened if when we went to a wedding, we just didn't go for cake? We just didn't go, to, to, oh, I like the band, or they're going to have some good songs. I like that new dance that they're doing, you know, during the dance, you know. We're Assemblies of God, so I know you're not going for the open bar. But what would happen if we went for a bigger picture than that? What if we were a group of people when someone from our group stands up here or stands somewhere and this loving couple, they're looking into each other's eyes, thinking it's all going to be beautiful, not realizing there's, rump, there's rocky roads, there's stuff going to come up. And they say stuff like, for richer, for poor, sickness and in health, for better, for worse, all of that kind of stuff. What if we as a group of people said, you know what? We're not here just to watch. We're here to stand with them and say, for richer, for poor, sickness and in health, for better, for worse, all of that. We're going to make sure that we stand with you together. That's part of our corporate deal. What if a church started really doing that? And when couples started having problems, we didn't go, oh, you know what? Maybe you guys just weren't meant for each other. That's said in the church sometimes. But we said, no, let's get together. Let's pray. Let's work this through. Let's do this together. We say we're going to be a part of this. And we change it. We become a church that doesn't fall into the 50% divorce rate like everybody else in the world does. But we, because we're a group of people who have a common mission, a common goal, a common direction, and it could even go into something like that. What would happen if when parents bring their little one this would be a good time. What would happen if, if parents would bring their little ones for a baby dedication? And, and we wouldn't just go, good luck, mom and dad. It's tough out there. And we wouldn't just go, oh, you got to know, your pastor, baby dedications are one of my favorite things as a pastor to do. Baptism. Leading somebody to Christ, ooh, that's right up there. But baby dedications, it doesn't get much better than that. I'm a sucker for a baby. Even when they spit up on me during baby dedications, it's okay. It's a ba I love it. But what if it wasn't about, ooh, isn't that a cute little kid? Oh, aren't they adorable? But that when we stood up here and mom and dad were up here and we said, mom and dad, we're charging you to do everything you can to train up your child in the way that they should go when they're old, they won't depart. What if we said, you know what, mom, dad? It's not just you. It's not just grandpa and grandma. It's just not uncles and aunts, but it's us. We're here to do it. And not only did we say it with our words, commercial time, 
But maybe we would even say, you know what? I believe this is so important. I want to be in the nursery with them to breathe life into them. I just got a a text this week and said, put me and my wife on. We need to be a part of it. We need to roll our sleeves up. We need to be a part of what's going on. There's ownership. Paul and Dawn, thank you for that. Saving moms one Sunday at a time. But what would happen? You know what? I look back over my life, and I thank God for the Spielmans. You don't know the Spielmans. But sister, we, when, the church I grew up in, it was sister and brother, everybody. Sister Spielman and brother Spielman, they were saints of the church, and they did, they did these times where they were in the nursery with us, and they, they didn't just play with us. They taught us who Jesus Christ was. They taught us the Bible stories. Stan Spielman, their son, was my first Royal Ranger leader. He was the guy that took us camping, the guy that did fifth and sixth grade boys teaching. Oh my goodness, he was a saint. Sister Masinda, oh my goodness, the patience that she must have had to take two and three year olds and just love us out of her own pocket if we memorized the verse would give us a quarter and in those days that was a lot of money that was 25 pieces of candy and not the little it was good sized candy but she invested in us because there was a mission there was a plan that that church had to say let's go forward and train up our children in the way that she go what if we did that what if we said Andrew I don't know if you need this or not but God's been saying I, I, I need to help you out and if we do center shot and we start getting 30 kids in here and their families and Andrew starts getting up to 20, 30, 40 kids, he's going to need some help. And we start getting a nursery that has 12 and 15 kids, we're going to have to split. We're going to have to figure out how to do that. What would happen if we had a mission that was something like this? We want to be a church that's about soul saved. We, 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 together, we're in that. Now, that doesn't mean we all do it the same way. There's a lot of ways to get people saved. There's center shot. There's nursery. There's children's church. There's maybe God's going to call a couple of you women to shotgun willies. Not to work, but to, to go and just say, to go up to the girls and say, you know what? Here's a basket. God loves you. And just walk away. I don't know, but what if we were a church that said, you know what? We're about soul saved. What if we're a church that's not only about souls saved, but lives changed? We want to be that kind of church. And we did it together. And all of a sudden, every day, not only what we pray about, God, help me get those bills paid. Lord, help me get this done. Lord, get my boss off my back. You know, those kind of things. God, get that person away from me, you know, as I'm driving. I pray a lot at Walmart. Y'all know that I confessed this before. I get cart rage. People don't know how to drive those things. They should need license. I think it should be like NASCAR. If they don't get out of your way, you get to bump them into the wall. No, not really. But, but what if we were going like, God, just touch their lives. We just started praying. We just started praying, not for them, but for everyone. It's 